this lecture is about the ways in which different parts of the world would collide. Clashing worlds. Let's start with an image. This is the first globe. Martin Bittheim, who was its maker, was an explorer, a mapper, a merchant, a navigator, a cosmographer, and he made money from making maps for the magnates and merchants of Europe, interested in what was going on in the rest of the world. And after a return from a, uh, a trip down the west coast of Africa, searching for gold, he came up with his idea of developing the first globe made between 1491 and 1493. Now, what's interesting about the globe is it's full of errors. This should not surprise us. Uh, people were still mapping parts of the world, but the biggest single error in the globe was that the Americas are missing. The Americas, this world apart that I'd mentioned in the last lecture. The Americas was not part of the Afro-Eurasian uh, trading system. For all of its differences, however, so even though it was not part of the pools of germs and diseases and commodities and peoples that flowed back and forth across Afro-Eurasia, there were some important commonalities. But we can ask ourselves, therefore, what does it mean to be a world apart? Well, it means essentially that the access to the pools of technologies and biota and knowledge uh, and uh, commodities of Afro-Eurasia did not affect developments in the Americas. Let's look first of all at technology. Especially in transportation and warfare, this was extremely important. Because Americans did not organize their technology in the same fashion. They did not have large uh, sailing vessels. Uh, they had not uh, developed the wheel. And one consequence of their uh, not having domesticated uh, animals uh, was that they had not harnessed much of this technology for fighting purposes. Americans did not develop the large scale fighting machines that Afro-Eurasian civilizations had. So while it had large population densities, large political systems, as we're going to see shortly, it did not mean that as an empire in the Americas expanded it, that it necessarily wanted to conquer its neighbors and uh, take over uh, all of its uh, peoples. Indeed, one of the important rituals of warfare for many American uh, uh, warriors was to take its captive peoples and adopt them into families. This was an important ritual of war from Mesoamerica to the Iroquois and afterwards. In the case of the Aztecs, uh, captive soldiers were taken uh, to uh, be used as uh, human sacrifice. So much more important for Americans in their military relationships with neighbors and people far away was rather than conquering lands and territories, which is what we saw in our last lecture in Eurasia, much more important was the capturing of peoples. The Americas had, in a sense, a different balance of human population to land, which meant that the humans that occupied the land were often more valuable to conquering civilizations than the land was. So one important effect of not being part of the Afro-Eurasian system is not sharing that same culture of warfare. Secondly was that the disease pool of Afro-Eurasia had not spread to the New World. The pool of pathogens was very different, and it meant that Native Americans simply had not developed the kinds of resistances to diseases that the Afro-Eurasians had. Now, the American cultures were not without their dynamism. It's very important that you dispel a common image of uh, 
uh, Native American peoples as quote unquote savages waiting inert for uh, the Westerners quote unquote to come along and bring the world, uh, this world apart into the modern age. Let's start with population. Once thought to be very small, natives living in the forest, uh, not creating complex, highly urbanized uh, civilizations. What we do know is by the late 1960s, many demographers estimated the Native American population to have reached almost 200 million people. Then demographers settled the estimate down to about 100 million. Now the estimates are creeping back upwards, especially based on new evidence we're drawing on the Amazon's ability to sustain high population densities. Furthermore, what we know is that there were some very large cities in the Americas, particularly in Mesoamerica, where the largest center in North America, uh, in North America was the city of Cahokia which had a population of about 60,000 uh, people. This is what it is estimated to have looked like at its peak. This is what Cahokia looks like now. The sprawling Incan Empire in the Andes also had large cities, the center of which was Cusco, which had a population of, at its peak, about 50 to 60,000 people. So we have very large populations of empires, sometimes with large cities at the center, uh, sometimes not. But either way, these, in some cases, had become giant empires. Many of them were reaching their peak by 1491. The biggest of them all, in terms of territory, was the Incan Empire in the Andes. But in terms of population, by far the biggest was the Aztec Empire in the center of Mexico. So this is an image of Tenochtitlan, the capital of the Aztec Empire in the late 15th century then. This is what the former capital of the Aztec Empire in the middle of Mexico looks like now.